Amen. Come on, let's just dive into this. We've been in a series for the past three weeks entitled, I've Decided 2024. And the thesis for this series is in a year of a uh, political year, an election year, where people are uh, vying for your votes and we're trying to figure out who we're going to put in the White House. I felt like it's important as a church, we put it in perspective and say, it doesn't matter who's in the White House if you don't have Jesus on the throne of your heart. And so I've decided is a series just saying we need to decide to follow Jesus. We need to decide to make Jesus the main thing and keep the main thing the main thing because this world will never change if Jesus is not in the hearts of people. Can I get a better amen in that moment? And so uh, we really want to dive into this. And so today our scripture reference is entitled, uh, it's Psalms 1914, a Psalm of David. And I want us to all read this together. It should be on the screen. Let's read this together. Ready? Read. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Come on, let's read it again. Ready? Read. Let the words of my mouth, come on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The underlying part, I want y'all to put a little emphasis on, okay? Verse 14. Ready? Read. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Today's tag to I've Decided 2024 is I've decided to watch my mouth. I've decided to watch my mouth. If the intro kills you, just say, ouch. Ouch. It, it, it kills you. It's been said that words are like bullets. Once they are released, they cannot be taken back. This is a fact of life that too many people take for granted though. Bullets can be used for good. I love hunting, I, lo I love hunting. You have a hunter as a pastor. Uh, Brother Larry David left me this week and went shot some birds without me, but that's fine, that's, uh, I love you. Uh, <laughs> he missed all the birds, okay, good. <laughs> he got enough for me to eat, that's all I'm worried about. But he went duck hunting without me. I, I love hunting. Cammie and Mr. Darrell, y'all love to hunt. And, and there's some hunters in here. I love to hunt. So it could be used for good, but bullets can also be used for destruction and evil. That's why it's, it's important that we have gun classes. I had to go to classes to be, learn the importance of, of, uh, of a gun and the power that a gun possesses and how it can cause destruction and, and hurt people and how to use them. I, I learned that, you know, my, my nine millimeter may not be sufficient to protect my house, so I have a shotgun. So don't break in my house. I, I will buckshot, but uh, it... It, it will happen. I mean, ask my kids. They know. I chase them around the house. They, they know what that means. You, you know what that? Some of you in here know what that means. Y'all know what that means. And so, <laughs> but, but I, I learned that I don't want to shoot through the walls. I want to hit my target. And so uh, I learned that guns can be used for good and protection, but it also can be used for destruction. Words are the same way. Words are the same way. We must respect the power that words have. And then too often, we, we use words haphazardly. We just throw them around. We just say things. We, we're loose at our lips, and we just say things and don't think about the havoc that it can cause. Uh, telling people you love them before you mean it. Hear me, young people. They're in the back, but we got, we got some singles in here, some saved people, single and victorious every day. Hear me, just because they say they love you don't mean they love you. They love what you can do for them. Amen. And so we have to be careful. Proverbs 18, 21, Solomon writes, he writes, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Look at there. 
Good and evil is in the power of the tongue. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. It's, it's right here in your mouth. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. As believers, we should always be mindful of our words. We should always be mindful of our words, cognizant of what is coming out of our mouth. We willed, we can't wield our words as tools of destruction and tools of deceit and tools of, of bringing people down, but be careful with what we say and how we say it. And it's not just audible, it's what you type on your social media. We have to be careful with the words that we put out. Once you put them out there, yes, you can delete it, but they will always be found. Someone saw it. Someone heard it. And then in one breath, you're saying, I love Jesus. In the next breath, you're tearing people down. Look at your neighbor and say, be careful with what you say. Here's a quote I want you to see by Carl Sandburg. He says this, be careful with your words. Once they are said, they can only be forgiven, not forgotten. If I was you, I'd write that down. They can only be forgiven. They will not be forgotten. I can forgive you, but it's hard to forget. I'm human. I'm not God that throws your sins as far as the east is from the west. Come on that throws your sins into the sea of forgetfulness. I, I, I'm, I'm human. And so your words, they, 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 they are like scars suffered from wounds. It's a reminder. My shoulder was fixed in February, and, but on my shoulder, I still have scars. So every time I see the scars, it's a reminder of the pain of my shoulder being worked on. Though the surgery was performed, I still have the scar from the surgery. So, so I, I, at, at a certain point, it's going to be like, hmm, I forgive them for hurting me, but I'll never forget how much it hurts. Can I get an amen? amen. Anyone ever been there before? Amen. To where some, you know, whoever says sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. They need to be took out back and get a switch off a tree. <laughs> words hurt. They hurt really bad. In our text today, because I'm Bible, in our text today, King David, uh, King David asks for his words and his thoughts to be acceptable in God's sight. He said, let my words and my thoughts be acceptable in your sight. The Bible describes David. When it writes about David, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. Now, this is David that, that, that slept with Bathsheba, basically raped Bathsheba, and, and then all of a sudden, he kills her husband. This is David. This is, this is the same David that God says, he's a man after my own heart. It's because of words like this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, be acceptable in your sight. The, the, so the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart because no matter what he did wrong, he always wanted to please God. Is that our heart? That we would rather please God than please man? That I would rather God to say well done than my neighbor to say well done. I, ooh, I would rather a like from God than a love on, on Facebook. <laughs> Trying to get our followers up and we're neglecting that, the person that we're following. Psalms 40, 45 and 1 says this, beautiful words stir my heart. I will recite a, lovely, recite a lovely poem about the king, for my tongue is like the pen of a skillful poet. My tongue is like the, the skill, a skillful poet, the pen of a skillful poet. Every time we speak, we are writing messages. We are, we are writing. Y'all think I'm the only one who writes messages. No, you write messages in your cubicle. You write messages on your job. You write messages in your house. You write messages in your community. You write messages wherever you are. You are like a skillful poet, and you're writing a narrative. The Bible calls us living epistles. Epistles just mean letters. You are writing letters every 
every time you open your mouth, every time you say something. So I would ask you this. If your letter is read out loud in front of the church, how would people see you? Will they see you as the believer that you say you are? Or would they call you a hypocrite because of the words that are coming out of your mouth? This was a depiction of how he wanted, David wanted his heart to speak from the purity of his heart. I want God to use me, but I want to speak from a place of purity of heart. Are you with me today? Do you hear me? Because sometimes our heart is a mess. Can I get an amen? The Bible says the heart of a man is deceitfully wicked. Who can understand it? Who can understand it? The context of our text is David is confessing. If you go back in, 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 our, in our opening text, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, it's David. You, you got to bag up. Remember, I can't give you a text without context because the text without context is a pretext which leaves you broken on side of the road. So I want to give you context of what David was writing in chapter 19. So we want to bag up a little bit. Verse chapter 19, verse Verse 12 through 13, this is what David says. He says, who can discern his errors? Equip me, equip me of my hidden faults. Also, tr- keep, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgressions. transgressions. And then he goes, oh, let the words of my mouth. And the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Why won't we say, God, I'm a wreck. God, my heart is messed up. God, I've been hurt. God, I'm I'm dirty. God, I'm not fit. God, but please, if you will quit me, I know that through the blood of Jesus, I can be acquitted of all these transgressions. And once I'm acquitted, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, we don't teach this enough in church we try to change your language before we change your heart I can't change your language if I don't appeal to your heart David said God my heart is the issue it's the hidden faults it's the one that I'm ashamed to say it's what the church don't give us permission to say come on we don't give you permission to say life sucks right now we don't give you permission to say you're depressed right now we don't give you permission to say that my wife and my and my wife is getting on my nerves my husband is getting on my nerves my spouse is just just ah my job is a mess right now we don't give you permission to say I I don't have it all together and I want you to know those hidden faults is what causes your heart to be tainted and if your heart is tainted your words will not be acceptable if you're gonna clap go ahead and clap it's fine and David is trying to teach us that our words have power write this down or take a picture We must investigate our hearts for things that may affect our speech. Search me, O Lord. That's what David said. Right here in this room right now, I am not crazy. I know there's some people in here with heart issues. And I'm not talking about the cardiovascular issue. I'm talking about you need soul therapy. Someone broke your heart. Someone did something. And, and every, every fifth sentence reverts back to where you were hurt. Your soul development is dwarfed at trauma. Every time you begin to think back, they call it toxic thought patterns. You you begin to walk the paved road of the toxic thought because that's the easiest way of resistance. So where your spouse says something that that reminds you of that, you instantly take that road back to negativity. And then you begin to speak from that pain of your past instead of the promise of your present. And so you begin to cause pain to others because of the trauma of your past, because all you know is this toxic thought pattern. And then what what you think will always come out. What what my mama used to say, what's in you going to come up. 
It, it's coming. It's, it's coming. It's going to come. You know, if you, if, you got, if you got that cussing spirit in you, it's coming. I'm going to find out. All I got to do is keep talking to you for a few seconds and be like, ooh, wee. Jeez. Can you control it? No, you can't control it because you never dealt with the heart issue. You never dealt with what was going on in your heart. People can know your heart by the words that come out of your mouth. You can have the right hallelujah. You can attend church every Sunday. You can be the biggest giver. But if I listen to your conversation, I know where your heart is. I can tell when you're hurt. As a pastor, one of the things I try to do all the time is when I see someone walking in, I try to see their pain. And then all I got to do is say, how are you? Are you okay? And then they start talking and they speak to me from their place of pain. And now I, I, I use my physical therapist all the time. They can't heal what I don't reveal. And we're not revealing where we're hurting, but we're causing more hurt because we're speaking out of that hurt. Do you hear me this morning? Yes. This is good. It's good. I love it when you're quiet. That means you should be writing. You should be taking notes. Come on. I love what Jesus writes in Luke chapter 6, verse 44 through 46. We're going to read from the Amplified Version. He says, for each tree is known and identified by its own fruit. For figs are not picked from a thorn bush, nor is a cluster of grapes picked from a briar bush. The intrinsically good Produce, good man produces what is good and honorable and moral out of the good treasure stored. Where? Where's the treasure stored? In our hearts. And the intrinsically evil man produces what is wicked and deprived out of the evil. Where? For his mouth speaks out from the overflow of his heart. So, a fig, a fig tree produces out of what is found at, in the seed or the root of a person. You know the root of a human being is the soul? You know that's your soul? And sometimes we pr keep producing the same fruit because we never deal with the root. And so we're, we're going to continue to push people away. We're going to continue to hurt people. We're going to continue to be inconsistent. We're going to continue to produce depraved things because in our heart, the root is corrupted. And we have to change the seed of wickedness and pick up the seed of righteousness. And we got to allow that thing to develop a, like a mighty oak on the inside of us. And we have to begin to produce fruit. Jesus walks up to a fig tree that had leaves from a distance and he was hungry. And he saw this fig tree and, and the fig tree had leaves. And, and he was like, oh, I'm going to eat some figs. And he walks up to the fig tree and it didn't produce fruit. And Jesus cursed the tree because it did not produce fruit. Who in here is not producing good fruit? It's okay. We're not going to leave you there. Amen? His heart. Say my heart. Can you be honest with yourself about where your heart really is? Did you really deal with the pain of the past relationship? Did you really deal with the pain of the last church hurt? Did you really deal with the pain of someone broken's promise? Did you really deal with the pain of someone you felt died on you prematurely? Did you really deal with that pain in your heart so you can learn to live in the promise of your presence? One of the hot topics, whether... You, if you don't know this, you've been living under a rock, is the, in our political climate, is the rhetoric of the candidates and the elected officials. They are calling for the language to cool, but, but every time I hear that, I laugh. I'm like, they're like, we need to let the rhetoric cool. We need to let the rhetoric cool. And I'm like, it ain't going to happen until they get Jesus in their heart. They're speaking from a, a wicked heart. The heart of a man is deceitfully wicked. Who can understand it? He says, from the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's coming out is hidden somewhere. It didn't just manifest overnight. 
So we're like, just change your speech. It is never going to change. And the church is, is complicit in this because we're trying to help them understand how to change their mouth from a political perspective instead of from a spiritual perspective. We're never going to impact this world if we rely on who's elected. Because they're all selfish. They'll tell you. My policy, my thing, this is what I want to do. No, we serve a God who is selfless. And we need to teach people to be selfless. And then if we teach them to be selfless and buy into who Jesus is, their heart will change. And if their heart will change, out of the abundance of the heart, their mouth will begin to speak. How would our words change if we acknowledge that God examines everything that comes out of our mouths? Y'all think just because you're not in church, they'd be like, some, some, I laugh at people when they come in and, they, and, they, and, they, and they'll drop a word and they'd be like, oh, my bad, I'm in church. I was like, it don't matter. It's just a building. You're the church. You know? No, don't you know if you say that outside the church? God is there also. <laughs> you worried about me. Look, I, I can't do nothing but talk about you. <laughs> I'm going to laugh at you. He's like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> but do you know God judges every word that comes out of your mouth? Every single word. Knowing that, would that change the way you speak? Or is it true what they say about our generation? We live in a generation that has no reverence for God. And that word reverence translates to fear. Where is the fear of God? I remember growing up, man, I used to have these 12s in my trunk. That we, I used to call them gorillas. And... Um, you know, I used to bump my music in my car, you know what I'm saying? I'm about to, my wife won't let me get none now, but I want to put some more speakers in my car. I, I mean, we'd be, you know, like, driving. But then the church is coming. You turn that thing off. You turn it off. I remember being young and my cousin's and was drinking and uh, Reverend Hall, I never forget Reverend Hall, Back in the day, the pastor used to, you know, you know, Andrew pastor used to come to the house after church, you know, and you cook that chicken, right, mama? You cook the chicken, and then, then the pastor come by your house, and and they and your uncles them and the deacons be out drinking, and they the red the red Dixie cups, you know what I'm saying? And then when pastor come, they go. Nowadays they be like, pastor, you want some? <laughs> There's no reverence for the things of God anymore. Where's the fear of God? Where's the fear of God? Because he judges all of our words. Matthew 12, 35 to 36, in Eugene Peterson's message, he says this, a good person produces good deeds and words season after season. An evil person is blight on the orchid. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. My wife, when we first got married, we didn't have a pastor in our lives. And so I would say some hurtful things to her. She would say some hurtful things to me. And we just keep it going. No one told us anything about that. Like, we would just say things. But it wasn't until I got the revelation that she was not my wife first, but she was God's daughter first. That I was like, ooh, I better watch my mouth because her daddy is a bad man. And so now I speak to her not as my wife. I speak to her as a child of God. Because I have a reverence for God. I have a reverence for my wife. And anyone be around me long enough, y'all know how much I love that lady. <laughs> like a little too much but I love her but I love the fact that God is trusting me with his daughter how about friends if you look at them as sons and daughters of God would you change the way you talk to them that he's going to judge your words the way you talk to people 
whether they did you wrong or not. We don't repay evil with evil. Whether they say something to us that warrants our words, you know what I'm saying? Like, we feel like they getting over on us. Oh, you ain't going to say that to me. I'm coming back. We just going to go back and back and back and back and back. No, 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 no. They may not know that they're going to be judged by their words, that a day of reckoning is coming. But you know better, especially after today. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Instagram. There's going to be a clip. There's going to be everything. We're going to email it to all you so you can't have plausible deniability. We want you to be held accountable for your words. Uh, uh, write this down or take a picture. Measure your words with the heart of God, not the inconsistencies of your emotions. Measure your words with the heart of God, not the inconsistencies of your emotions. I love the way Paul wrote it to the church. Uh, he, he wrote this in Colossians 3, 8. He says, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Put them all aside. I, uh, uh, I, I love what uh, Anthony Evans said once to our church. He said, I don't speak from a place of emotions because my emotions have no intellect. They have no intellect. I was talking with Pastor Brent this week, and I was like, isn't it amazing that you can love someone to death, literally, literally kill them, and then when they arrest you, they say, I killed them because I loved them. Yeah. Not hate them. Yeah. I love, if, if I can't be with them, no one can be with them. How often do we hear that on TV? Yeah. We, we, can, we can hate someone so much that we will assassinate them with our words. We will slander them. We will destroy their lives with our words. Paul said, put all that aside. Say, Lord. Come on, say, Lord. Lord. Help me. Help put all that aside. Because you know my heart. You know my heart. And, and, and that's, not, that's not the way that unbelievers use that phrase. The Lord knows my heart. I always go, he does, and he is not pleased. He knows your heart. We have to be extremely cautious with our words, and we have to put aside anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from our mouth. While our soul is where we find our mind, will, and emotions, don't speak out of soulless distress. I have a rule here at this church. If I am emotionally 75%, I do not make decisions for this church. Because there's a 25% chance that I'll ruin the lives of the people that God has trusted me with. So I lean on our elders. I lean on our pastors. I lean. This was a 75% week for me. 75% week for me. Burying a spiritual son on Monday that I hadn't spoken to in over 15 years. That was on me. I was sitting in the funeral and, and man, I was just sitting there thinking like all the things I would tell him if I had one more chance. But because of my pride, because of a little anger that I had, I shut him off and now I'm committing him to his final resting place. We can't do that. We can't live our lives from any soulless distress. We have to begin to deal with that place. Guys, I'm, 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 I'm telling you, Holy Spirit is dealing with some of you in this room right now. With that soul distress. That God says, no, I'm trying to clean up your heart so I can clean up your speech. Because I need you speaking faith-filled words. Not words of death, but words of life. Solomon said, life and death is in the power of the tongue. We read that earlier. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me online? So let me help you. How many of you want to learn to watch your mouth? How many of you need to learn how to watch your mouth? <laughs> 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 Who 
Oh, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Hey, we live in Louisiana. We the, we the nicest people on the planet. People love us so much, but they don't know what that. Bless your heart. That's loaded. Oh, it's so loaded. That means you better take five steps back because it's about to go down. Oh, I'm fentanyl. I'm fent. I'm fent. I'm fentanyl. <laughs> right? We live in the South. We need help, y'all. <laughs> We, we need help. We so nice, but we, we mm-hmm. Yes, Lord. So let me help you. To watch our mouths, we must, number one, first, be gentle with our words. We have to be gentle with our words. Proverbs 15, 1 says, a gentle ans- answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle word. We have to be gentle with our words. We have to make sure that we're gentle with our words, right? We, we can't just, just be hard all the time in the name of being hard. Oh, I'm just, I'm just being hard. Oh, I'm just, I'm just going to be, I'm just, no, 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 no. You're a born again believer. You follow Jesus. We talked about that last week. You're a follower of Jesus. No, you have a responsibility to be gentle with your words. I, I, I have a problem with pastors who just try to be, you know, uh, uh, hard with their words and, and don't speak from a place of gentleness. This. We should be the most gentle people on the planet because whom much is forgiven, we must forgive much. I try to talk to you like I talk to my kids because the same hand that chastises is the same hand I want them to be able to hug me with. So I'm going to give you the tough truth, but it's going to be gentle. It's going to be gentle because we serve a gentle God. We serve a God that's full of grace, full of mercy. Yes, Lord. Thank you. So a gentle answer turns away wrath. The second way we must watch our mouth is be kind with our words. We have to be kind. Proverbs 16, 24 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. It's sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Thank the Lord. So we have to be kind with our words. When we see someone, you, you, like I said, because we love others compassionately as a church, we have to be kind with our words. We have to edify people, build them up, build them up, help them, help them get hope. We're the church of hope, right? And so we have to begin to be kind with our words. Gentle and kind. When they leave from you, they should feel 10 feet tall. 10 feet tall. Here we have a culture of the last percent conversation. If we have a last percent conversation with you, I always leave the person feeling bigger than they walked into that meeting. If you ever met with me, I, I can be a little tough, a little, a little tough, just a little, a little bit. But I'm, I'm never going to leave you in the doldrums of that conversation. Whether you right, wrong, or indifferent, it doesn't matter. I'm going to build you up at the end. My words are kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. I never speak from a place of anger or wrath. If I'm feeling anger or wrath, I get quiet right there. I just shut up. My grandma told me a long time ago, if you ain't got nothing good to say, I said, oh, I just get quiet. And then when I calm down and I'm not in soulish distress, I begin to have conversations because now I can accomplish something. We can make it. Can I get an amen? amen? Another way we watch our words is be more calculated with our words. <laughs> this, this is the one. We need help with. We got to be a little bit more calculated with our words. Proverbs 16, uh, Proverbs 10, 19, and the message says this, the, the more talk, the less truth. The wise measure their words. Wise people measure 
their words. We have to be extremely careful. We have to measure our words. I, if you ever talk to me, I, I'll talk to you and I'll go, mm, let me, um, I'm looking for the right words to say for this moment. When I text, I ask my wife, how does this sound? What does this look like? If I'm posting something on my social media, most of the time it's going to be about the Lord anyway. It doesn't matter. So I'm like, I'm asking the Lord, is this okay? Does this represent you well? Does this, does this show your heart? Does this represent you in a way that I can present it. My words are extremely measured. I used to be so loose with my words, y'all. Just, I would say something and don't care because I didn't know they were like bullets. I didn't know that I could never take that back. Henceforth with my spiritual son, the, the last conversation I had with him, I was like, hey man, look, we're going to replace, because he was the interim pastor at the first church I planted. And I said, hey man, look, they, they, they got a problem with you, so I'm going to replace you. And I left it like that. And those are the last words I've said to him. And because I was ashamed, I never went back and fixed it. But if I knew then what I know now, I would have been a little bit more measured with my words. It wasn't that he wasn't qualified. It's just that he wasn't mature enough to handle the weight of the ministry. That's the way I would have said it. How many of you guys need to go back and be a little bit more measured with your words with someone? Go back and clean up that mess. Take out the, the verbal mop and say, when I said this to you, this is what I really meant. When I talk to our team, they always laugh because our meetings go long because I say the same thing three times. I do that intentionally because I want to make sure that there's no ambiguity in what I said because I want to be measured with my words. I want, so I'll say things like in our meetings, I'll say stuff like, hey guys, we, we're, we're going to do this fall fest and then the fall fest is going to be done like this. Then I'll come back around and say, hey, the city asked us to participate in this fall fest and, and, and the city is going to help us with it. And I'll come back around and say, hey guys, the church exists for a community and a community doesn't exist for the church. So that's why we're doing a fall fest because I want them to understand that there's no ambiguity in what I'm saying. So I say it three ways. I'm very measured. That's intentional because I've heard a lot of people by just throwing stuff out there. Married couples, give me a what, what? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You just said something in a soulless distress that you're like, oh, can't clean that one back up. You just hope for grace. The last one is this. Be mindful not to engage in evil speech. Be mindful not to engage in evil speech. Psalms 34, 13 says this, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Keep your tongue from evil. <laughs> keep your tongue from evil. One more time for you. Keep your tongue from saying what your heart is telling it to say. When you want to say the other F you, just say forgive you. Just say it. Just say forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you, Lord. I forgive you. Build people up. Build people up. Write this down or take a picture. The reality of our world have been framed by the words of our mouth. The world you live in today is the result of your yesterday's conversation. James writes in James chapter 3, 5 through 6, he says, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our lives and is set on fire by hell. The tongue. Look at your neighbor and say, watch your mouth. Look at your other neighbor and say, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta watch your mouth. It is set 
a forest on fire. It has set the world on fire. The world is on fire now, not because we're shooting at each other, it's because we're shooting at each other. There's divisiveness. There, 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 is, there, is, there is no commonality. We live in the most divisive time ever because of words. And if people will take the time to measure their words and really say what they want to say, you, you, you wouldn't end in the conclusion that you came in because you really hear their heart. I want to hear their heart. Imagine this. Peter comes up to Jesus. Jesus is like, I'm getting ready to die. Peter says, no, you're not. I'll fight for you. I'll stand for you. I got your back, homie. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter like, wait, what, what? I just said I had your back. But Peter heard Jesus' heart. When you speak to someone, do they hear your heart? Because your heart is pure? Or do they just hear the malice, the anger, the wrath that's in your heart? We were working on something at the house. My son PJ and I were working on something. And and my daughter, Elisa, she is so sensitive. So where's she at? Oh, she's in the back of the youth. But she is sensitive. And so I'm talking to PJ and I'm like, PJ, no. I said, flathead. No, I said number 12. I need a number 12 socket. That's what I need. I need a 12. And Elisa's like, stop yelling at him. I'm like, I'm not yelling at him. PJ looked at her and laughed and said, oh, you didn't hear yelling. Because he knew my heart. He knew I was teaching him. I wish I would have learned that as a young man. And, and, I, and I explained that to him in the beginning. I said, when you work with me, I'm going to be direct. I'm going to be firm because I'm trying to teach you something now because daddy won't always be here. I don't want you to know. So he know when I'm being firm and direct, he understands that. And my whole family, they all get sensitive when I talk to him. He's the only one that don't get sensitive because he knows. He knows like, y'all don't know what yelling is. Y'all soft. Like, y'all don't hear dad's heart. Dad's heart is preparing me for the future. And sometimes God will chastise you, and you'll hear, what what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And it'll be from your spouse. It'll be from your pastor. It'll be from a friend. It'll be someone that loves you. Why did you speak to your spouse that way? And you have to examine your soulless distress at that moment. And then at that moment, you got to begin that you have just set a forest on fire because you spoke from a place of hell flames. We have to be careful, church. I'm tired of us just using our words to tear people down. I'm tired of turning on social media or TV or something and watching people being torn down as if they're not even human. If you partaken in that, this is the morning that we put the fire out, that we say, God, look at my heart, the hidden faults of my heart, and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, God, I need you. That's my life. Come on, stand to your feet. At every funeral, there's a eulogy given. There's a eulogy given. That word eulogy just comes from the word eulogio, which means to just speak well of. To religiously, it means to bless, to thank or invoke. Put a benediction upon. To prosper. That's, that's what that means. To prosper, to bless, to praise. Eulogy is not reserved just for funeral. We should eulogize people every day. Let me, let, me, let me make it 21st century. You should give people their flowers while they're living. We're so busy trying to tear people down that we forget that we need to be a blessing to people. Spouses, tell your spouse every day how much you love them and appreciate them. Parents, tell your kids how great they are, how, how, how amazing they are. I have a rule in my house, and I do this at the church, and I tell all of our leaders this. 
It's so funny because they abused me. I look for every reason to tell them yes. So when I do say no, they can respect it. And my kids, they're, they're crafty. Dad, can I? Dad, can I? And I go, I don't see a reason to say no. Yes, you can. Yes, 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 yes. Then if, the, if I want to say no, I say, ask your mama. They automatically know what that means. They're like, well, I ain't going tonight. <laughs> but there are some things that we need to clean up. We need to begin to eulogize people. Let's not wait till they're dead to where we're standing over their body crying tears, saying, I wish I would have told you I love you. I wish I would have told you I care for you. I wish I would have been there for you. I wish I would have told you how great you were and how awesome you were. So the, my, my, my spiritual son, Pastor Latoy, who passed away, his brother is a pastor now and his wife is a worship leader. And we were hard on them. Y'all get the nice pastor pitch. They, they got the hard pastor. You, you. <laughs> I mean, when I say hard, I'm talking about putting them under weights that they couldn't lift physical bench press like you want to be a minister bench this pray for me I was crazy I didn't have a pastor at the time y'all I just was doing the best I can I was like the measure of a man is how much you can bench you know like you can't bench that you don't need to be a man and Derek was the main one laughing so <laughs> but he preached his brother's eulogy and I was bawling she was crying I was bawling because his wife came to us she's a doctorate of music and she was a worship leader and I remember when she first came she's like I can't do worship I can't do it. my wife was like shut up and sing worship like we were hard like it was rough it was rough. like real <laughs> he said something we're big Hamilton's fan and he was like why do you write like you're running out of time and we were we were leading like we were running out of time we didn't know that God was going to pull us out of that ministry but we were pushing them so hard because we were running out of time. So it was like, y'all need to grow up, y'all need to grow up. And so she led the worship at the funeral. He preached the eulogy at the funeral. And I was sitting back crying tears of joy and tears of pain and tears of hurt. And as he was preaching, he was using pits, idiotisms. And he was like, let me take the cookies and put them on the bottom shelf. I said, baby, what did he just say? I hadn't seen him in over 15 years. And he still says stuff. He was like, like Pastor Pitt saying, da -da 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 -da. I was like, oh my God, you never know the impact. And so we caught him at the uh, committal and I said, man, let me tell you something. I say, for the rest of your life, I'm championing what you're doing. I say, you're going to hear from me at least once or twice a month with me just telling you how proud I am of you. He was like, you don't understand. When you call, he said, when you called me after my brother died, I cried for hours because I didn't know how much I needed to hear your voice. There are people that need to hear your voice. Who are they? I don't know who you've hurt. I don't know who you left on red. You know, that, that, they say with the text, you just left them on red. You need to go back and complete that. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as a good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give who? What? Grace. That it will give what? Grace. That it will give what? Grace. To who? Y'all, we're here to edify people. Let no unwholesome words come out of your mouth. I'm not telling you to go around lying, but I'm telling you to go around eulogizing people, giving them their flowers, blessing them, praising them, giving them the benediction, which is, which, so, so eulogy, the benediction is the finality of, uh, of, of a situation. So by the time we leave, we're going to have a benediction about this argument. This argument was from the devil. And so while we finish, we're done. We're going to speak blessings. So let me ask this question. How many of you today choose to watch your mouth? How many of you today choose to speak more blessings than curses? How many of you today is going to shape the world with the word of God instead of words of hate? Amen. Those of you online, same thing.
So right here in this moment, I want to pray a blessing over you. In, in Numbers chapter 6, I have it actually tattooed on my arm. Numbers chapter 6, they call it the ironic benediction. This is a blessing that God told Aaron to pray over the people. And it was a blessing that God released over them. And I want us to all pray this prayer together. Um, ready? Read. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and then I will, and I will then bless them. Let's do it again from the top. Ready? Read. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So shall they invoke my name on the... And then we'll... Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Come on, lift your hands right here in this moment and we're going to sing this blessing over you. Come on, receive this blessing. And as you go... They call it the ironic benediction. So all this stuff that the enemy did in your heart, it is finished. Come on. It is finished. It is finished. Amen. Do you receive it? Come on, from the top, from the top, from the top. Come on. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Come on, let's say that again. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you sounds good come on make his face shine upon this is the beginning of your new speech come on Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace come on let's make it final come on say all man come on
of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight oh Lord and we declare today that we'll speak blessings over our family over our children we 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 cancel the past because you're behind us we speak to the promise of the future because you're before us and we come against every attack of the enemy because you're beside us. And God, we walk in the authority that we will not be affected by soulless distress because you are within us. And Father, we give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Thank May you so much for joining us online today. We would love to continue connecting with you at anchorchapel.com where you can fill out a connect card. We would also love to partner with you in prayer and giving. We just want to remind you that there, there is hope, hope for, for every soul. soul.